As the Tev Tricard made its second survey pass around the previously unexplored system, the Night Shift suddenly finished up their handover reports and began the final end of shift routines. On the bridge, Lieutenant Hansen watched as the newly arrived Astro Navigator plotted a slingshot maneuver to take the ship to the fourth planet in the system, a gas giant with 20-something moons, one of which was the size of Earth. The XO knew that this moon would be of particular interest to the fleet command and had commissioned an additional flyby and survey scan. On a strike of 0700 hours, Captain Derish marched onto the bridge in his parade wear. Complete with enough medals and accommodations on the left side of the jacket to make the captain slightly lopsided, he marched up to his command console, extracted a grey, one-inch diameter, half-metre long cardboard pipe with the words confetti hastily written along the side, and loudly proclaimed, Merry New Year's Easter Dragon October Festival, then proceeded to raise the cardboard pipe to his mouth, hesitate a second, then murmur, Prost, before he returned his head to the end of the pipe, and inhaled sharply. The cloud of confetti saliva mix that Hansen had expected to see ejecting from the pipe was impressively absent, as the captain doubled over in a coughing fit, having inhaled the content of the pipe. Captain Derish managed to clear his lungs before the on-ship bridge medic had reached him, and subsequently straightened his back before he broke out into song. Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday, dear coffee maker! The captain gestured at the weapon system operator with open arms and a wide smile as the residual confetti saliva mix spewed out of his mouth. Happy birthday to you! I'll go make a pot, sir. The gunner rose from his seat and headed out of the bridge. Derish nodded once and murmured, a uh, good man, before he returned to the captain's console and took his seat. Mr. Lieutenant Officer Hansen Person Nelson, what is our status? he said, while continuously adjusting and readjusting the height of his chair, an activity that made the captain giggle. A second survey of the giant moon, Captain. We've just initiated the flyby vector. Ah, yes, Derish nodded. Have we named it yet? No, sir. Hansen almost managed to hide the concerned twitch at his cheek. Right, let's let the crew name this one. I'll take suggestions in my mailbox and pick the name from them. An elated... Sight escaped the XO, as he replied with a, Yes, sir. Sir, the sensor suite operator called for attention. You need to see this. What is it? Hansen walked over to the sensor station and looked at the readouts. There seems to be an active power production on the surface of the moon. The operator sounded hesitant. Do we have an ID? Hansen definitely ignored the captain's cap as it interjected itself into the conversation over the operator's left shoulder, sporting an unnaturally large pair of googly eyes on the front, bobbing up and down in rhythm with the words. Um, no, Captain. The sensor operator managed to keep a straight face through the reply. Hansen turned to the view screen and squinted at a dot that rose from the moon's surface. What is that? He murmured to himself before it dawned on him. The dot was an alien ship. Ready stations, all hands on deck, shipwide yellow alert. He bellowed as the sensors identified the ship as a design and type that the Terran fleet had designated as Destroyer. The ship lighting switched from soft white blue to an insisting yellow as the crew hurried to their ready stations. Hansen made it to his position, a spot on the floor halfway between the captain's console and the astro navigation console where he activated his mag boots, a necessary precaution due to the lack of a safety harness in the seat. His attention was caught by a strange grunt from behind his left shoulder. He turned to see Captain Derish forcing a hand behind his, still buckled belt. Having found what he was looking for, the captain's face lit up with an expression of victory as he heaved his hand out of his pants, his fist clutching a white cotton fabric. Hansen recognised the captain's trademark tighty whities and felt a shiver run down his spine as the undergarment's natural attachment to the captain's legs resulted in a halt of the extraction manoeuvre. Derish gripped the briefs with both hands and heaved once again. This time the effort resulted in a strained whimper as the captain managed to get the undergarments lifted to chest height and above the resulting reverse wedgie made itself present. Both leg hoops of the underwear were visible above the belt. As a determined repositioning of the hands, a grunt and the sound of ripping seams later the captain stood victorious with a soiled and brown-yellow stained soggy garment in his hands. 
He made a messy ball of the dripping rags and held it at the small dot on the main view screen. Hansen followed the ball as it sailed through the air, across the bridge, and made a wet sound as he made firm contact with the screen. A full second passed before the ball of filth began a slow descent down the screen, dragging a wet brown trail behind it. Hazmat contingency on the bridge, enable lockdown, Hansen bellowed as the two white lights above the door to the bridge turned bio-alert purple and the doors locked. Everyone on the bridge pulled out their full face masks and plunged the connectors into the external air supply. Hansen turned his head so that the captain was in his full view. Really? he asked. As an answer, Captain Derrick squatted down in his haunches and rested his knuckles against the decking while sounding out low hoots. Hansen looked at the astronav operator and sighed. Nose down, pivot on the top view x-axis. He then nodded to the comms operator. Engine... The sergeant began before Hansen cut him off. Put him through. Why are the biofilters reporting chemical warfare on the bridge? The chief engineer asked the second the connection was put through. Events have occurred, chief. Hazmat protocol is active. Hansen was all business. I'll need you to drain the waste processing tanks into life pod 17 ASAP. What event? The CE began before his brain caught up with his mouth. Oh. Oh no. ETL on that life pod, Chief. Hansen forced the man back on the mindset that was needed. There's no drainage running that way, so we'll need a manual hose. The CE's voice shifted, as he must have turned away from the intercom. We'll need 30 metres of the 4-inch type 3 hose and break out the contingency pallet. I don't think we can use enough duct tape for this job. Full house map people, this will get messy. The CE's voice returned to normal. 15 minutes to hook it up, sir. 10 to drain the tanks. Do you want solids as well? Everything you've got, Chief. Ready in 10 minutes. Hansen killed the connection with a hand gesture and addressed the navigator. Miss Red Horseshoe, get us to 300 RPM and align the Y-axis with the incoming vessel. Okay. The Academy Fresh Navigator didn't have time to process the orders. She just obeyed. Time passed slowly as the dot on the screen grew larger. They're slowing down, sir, the sensor sweep reported in. Engineering is ready in 15 seconds, they're sealing the pod now. Comms followed up. Calculate the release trajectory for optimal momentum transfer. Aim for their centre mass. Hansen calmly eyed the captain as he barked out the orders. Derish was hooting and gorilla stomping around the command console. The aftermath of his endeavour was dragging a slush trail after him as the semi-solid liquid was sifted through his pants. Life pod is sealed and ready. Trajectory locked and release calculated. <laughs> release the pod. All sounds and movements on the bridge halted as the slush ball released the screen and smudged onto the floor at the same time as Life Pod 17 was attached from the tricard. The momentum transferred to the pod gave it an immediate acceleration to 0.1 luminol and the pod shot off from the spinning ship and headed straight towards the alien destroyer. The ship reciprocated by firing a plasma volley at the pod. The impact caused the pod to glow a bright orange as the atmospheric re-entry plating took the brunt of the first volley, effectively absorbing the majority of the superheated projectile's energy. The second volley came too soon for the shielding to have migrated the stored heat and split the pod open like a water balloon. The septic content of the pod continued its trajectory and speed uninhibited and made impact with the alien vessel. The superheated sewage splattered across the front of the hull as the destroyer's attempt at sidestepping the incoming soup resulted in a fairly long skid mark down the port side of the vessel. The sewage that had absorbed enough heat to burn, had there been an atmosphere to supply the oxygen, was developing large gaseous pockets between the semi-solid and the hull. The manoeuvring thrusters must have used atmospheric air as fuel as a series of explosions ran down the skid mark. The alien ship began tilting in a less than controlled manner and the few lights that were on the outside of the hull blinked on and off in erratic patterns. Then a series of smaller pods were ejected from the dying destroyer. Hold the rotation and move into intercept, alert xenobiology that will need accommodation suited for their needs and sweep up as many of those escape pods as possible. Hansen didn't hesitate. Get me catering. Lieutenant? The camp boss sounded exasperated. I'll need to disinfect and clean up on the bridge and more fibre in the captain's diet. Do I want to know? You're going to have to read the AAR. If I have to retell this more than once, someone is getting hurt. 
A full second passed before the ball of filth began a slow descent down the screen, dragging a breath. <laughs> Life pod is sealed and ready. Trajectory locked and release calculated. <laughs> release the pod. Oh, sounds. <laughs> <laughs>